Our second presentation this afternoon <coughs> is from Dr. Sereni Dharma Pori. I get it correct? But I'm getting better at it every year. Sereni is an ASPRS certified photogrammist and licensed photogrammic surveyor in South Carolina and Virginia, as well as a certified GIS professional and project management professional with 28 years of experience. You got a lot of initials behind your last name. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, he is the lead our, LIDAR scientist for Michael Baker International Pittsburgh. Uh, Shereni is responsible for management of all LIDAR processing activities involving extraction, algorithm development, quality assurance, and product delivery. Uh, Shereni has a master's in physics and remote sensing and a doctorate in satellite photogrammetry. And he's a PhD behind that too, right? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Mark. And uh, also thank the organizers for uh, giving uh, this opportunity to present a paper on uh, managing multiple LIDAR data sets, um, challenges in the pipeline-related studies. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will be not only talking about the challenges, but also uh, over a period of time, uh, we have gained some experience in uh, solving some of the challenges or uh, uh, coming up with some solutions. So during the course of this presentation, uh, we will be talking about some of the, uh, the, the solutions also. So the, uh, the broad agenda for this presentation is, uh, you know, um, three different areas we will be, I will be talking about. One, one is the, the light or data related. Uh, the second one is the break lines related. And finally, the third one is the product related. So, so these are all the three broad areas which I'll be covering in the next 20, 25 minutes. So this is a standard uh, LiDAR project workflow. Um, uh, as all of you know, uh, you'll be using the elevation data, particularly from LiDAR, on a on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, the, this technology has been, you know, uh, it has been in place uh, since uh, 2000. Um, the technology has grown very well, and uh, the, the calibration, validation, and the processing methodology has improved. So this is a standard uh, workflow um, adopted in terms of collecting and processing the LiDAR, you know, starting from planning, um, collection, doing the pre-processing of uh, range data, uh, the GPS data, the IMU data, and then you jump onto the LiDAR data processing. That is where you extract the ground points and uh, also you you know and also you collect the break lines and then you finally you get on to the post processing that is where you create the products uh, mostly uh, the surface as well as the contours are the standard products that comes out of the lidar projects but there are, there can be a large number of derivative products that can be uh, that can be derived from the lidar data and uh, finally of course the quality control is an integral component of any lidar project and of course, this uh, workflow is um, is uh, applicable as long as you have a project area, you go over, collect the data, and process the data. If that is the case, and this workflow works out very well. But in the case of pipeline projects, we face a different situation or a different scenario. That means we have to come up with a different workflow uh, to handle the situation. So with that, I will go straight away into the first one, uh, the LiDAR data, uh, multiple, I mean, the, the challenges with regard to the LiDAR data. So you guys are, you know, um, I've been in the, in the oil and, predominantly in the oil and gas industry. Uh, the, the first few statements are very straightforward. You know, one is the, in, in majority of the cases, or in most of the cases, the pipeline corridors will have a high resolution LiDAR data. And uh, these high-resolution LiDAR data is processed in a contiguous manner, or it can be a non-contiguous manner. The most important thing is, whenever the pipeline alignment changes, obviously the corridor also undergoes a change. So what happens is, whenever there is a change in the pipeline alignment, then the corridor changes. And when the corridor changes, what happens is, you will end up in some data gap. In the sense, you start with a version one, let us say the, that's the version one of the pipeline corridor, or the pipeline alignment, version one, and you have the, the entire data set covering the entire corridor is available. The moment you change the pipeline um, alignment, then the corridor changes, then there is some data gap. So what happens is you have to get some new LiDAR data, process, 
and uh, match the already existing data. It's very easy to say. That means you collect the new data, stitch it, stitch it with the old data. That's very easy to tell, but that is where I think we have to go through certain uh, processing challenges. And, um, and the other important thing is, uh, when you are using multiple LIDAR, LIDAR data sets, the, the specifications may not be the same. You know, uh, it, The data can come from multiple vendors, and uh, there can be different uh, specifications that have been used uh, in, in terms of collecting the data. So these are all some of the issues or the challenges uh, when, you, when you get into the multiple LIDAR data sets. So here is a classic example of what I, what I talked in the previous slide. Uh, this is a start, a start of a, a long uh, pipeline corridor. And you know, the each color signifies uh, something which will be shown in the, the next slide. As you can see, the green line or the green color is the original data set that was collected on date one, covering the entire, entire corridor. And then, as I said, when the pipeline alignment changed, the corridor also changed, and that calls for some, I mean, that, that results in some data gaps which needs to be collected, processed. And what you are seeing, the, the yellow color are the ones which are the data gaps, and uh, we need to go and collect fresh LiDAR data, process them, and uh, stitch with the already existing, the green color LiDAR data. So in this case, you can see uh, we have four different data sets. One is the data set one, collected and processed by a vendor, some other vendor, on a date one, and that has been already validated. It has gone through a quality assurance process. And uh, the, the, the down below the data set two is a sort of brownish yellow color that's uh, collected for by another vendor. And uh, the, the third one, the third and fourth one are those uh, which were collected by my company uh, for those gap areas. And then we have to create a seamless product, taking into consideration all the data sets, in this case, four different data sets. There may be a situation, the number of data sets may be more, depending upon how the pipeline um, corridor changes. So this is a same example uh, you know, in a more detailed manner. So the, 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 the basic bottom line is, is that, I think, you know, in, in a particular corridor case, we need to handle four different data sets. So that's what the and 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 the challenges associated with handling the multiple data sets and creating a seamless product. So now, uh, whatever I, I showed in the images, this is what the uh, in a in a nutshell. So we have the the data set one um, collected in 2011 timeframe, um, and you know the break lines uh, which I will be talking subsequently were captured as a 2D break lines, which means there is no Z value, and the data set two. Again, you know, it was collected in 2011, 12 time frame. The brake lines were available as uh, 2D brake lines. Whereas uh, the collection in 2013 and 2014 has been performed by uh, my company. And we have collected the brake lines using the radar geometry methods, which means you can, it, will be, it is a 3D brake line collection, which means you will have the XYZ values. So this is, a, so you can see the multiple uh, data sets and uh, you know you need to create uh, a seamless product out of the four multiple four data sets. So this is in a table. Uh, you can see the um, um, the area wise. You can see the data set one was uh, collected for close to 605 square miles. As I said, it was done in 2010 time frame. Data set two was you know for around 28 square miles. And uh, data set three and four, which is done by my company, was you know in uh, 2013 and 2014 for 59 square miles and 160 square miles. It's a substantially uh, a big big project, um, so it involved a lot of effort in terms of you know processing, validating, and as well as you know creating a seamless product. Now, uh, what is the first stage? You know, we know what are the we know we have, we know that we have got four different data sets. So what is the first step in uh, going forward? The very first step is the review of metadata. And I think that's very critical, or that is the first step in, in, in terms of processing. So you go through each every data set and see uh, what are the you know, parameters that were used in data collection in terms of uh, the pulse density, uh, the number of points per square meter, so on and so forth. The second point is what the very critical thing, uh, because every LiDAR data set will have its own vertical accuracy. So at the time of collection, you will specify that the data needs to be collected 
at a 12 centimeter vertical accuracy or 10 centimeter vertical accuracy. So when merging multiple data set, you need to make sure that the vertical accuracy of the data set <coughs> are very close or exactly the same. We cannot take two different data sets. One is uh, 10 centimeters or 12 centimeter vertical accuracy. The other one is a 24 centimeter vertical accuracy. Try to create a product. I think we can still create a product. I would not say we cannot. We can, but that is that is not is going to yield a product what you are looking for. For example, normally a 10 to 12 centimeter uh, vertical accuracy LiDAR product is suitable for two foot contours whereas uh, 20 to 24 centimeter is for four foot contours. So you cannot mix and match two different data sets with the two different vertical accuracy um, parameters. And the other one is of course the completeness of the data set in terms of you know, what sort of break lines have been collected, whether it's a 2D, 3D. And uh, the, the fourth one is very critical, you know, the datum projection. This is a problem almost every GIS folks will handle when you are happy. different data sets will come with the different projections, datum and so on and so forth. And um, and also the, uh, the the industry standard guidelines. You know, some people will follow some FEMA guidelines or the USGS guidelines. Some of you guys, the oil and gas companies, they have their own guidelines. So make sure that you know you are you are handling the data sets which are all comparable to each other. Now we cannot take two two separate data sets, try to mix and match and create a one seamless product. And the last one is very critical thing. You know, temporal elevation changes. There are areas. In, if there are a lot of changes that are taking place on the ground, then you know you need to apply some caution because once there is some construction or something like that has taken place in 2000 data set, whereas in 2014, I mean you know in 2010 there are no changes. In 2014, some construction has already taken place. Then you will face some issues in terms of merging the data. So, the what are the goals of merging? The the, the goals are one is when. <clears throat> The most important thing is when we have uh, the two data sets are merged, the, the elevations, uh, you know, the, the differences in the elevation should be minimized because, you know, um, that's, that's a very critical thing. More the elevation difference between the two, da two data sets, that will reflect uh, in, the, in the contours. And the second thing is, of course, the vertical difference along the tie edge will not exceed the FEA. The FEA is the fundamental vertical accuracy. That's a parameter that will come along with the LiDAR data set. So these are all the two important things we have to keep in mind when we are merging two different data sets. And uh, what, we, what we do is then, uh, you know, you go through the data sets, uh, find out the overlap areas, and, uh, you know, you compare the two ground surfaces. Suppose if you have a data set one and data set two, uh, create a ground surface of data set one and two, and then, you know, find out what is the vertical offset that should be applied. And again, you cannot apply a one single vertical offset along the entire corridor. That will never work. So there is no single or a, a sort of silver bullet type of thing wherein you find one single vertical shape that needs to be applied. That way, all the data set will be you know, uh, seamlessly fit together. It will never happen. It, it will be a sort of iterative process. And you have to go through the entire data set from north to south and you know, find out the group of areas where you can apply a certain shift. And there will be another group of areas where the vertical shift will be somewhat different. And uh, with that, this is what I think has, uh, has happened in the project. You can see we have grouped the entire project area into three groups, group one and two, three. And within that group, there are different areas were there. And uh, we have applied, this is a vertical shift that was applied, as you can see. It is not a single uh, shift that was applied along the corridor. We have applied different shifts at different groups and different areas. So that, that way, we are able to bring all the data sets to a comparable level. So the, once the, the shift has been applied, the, whatever the, talk, the, the shift I'm talking about is vertical, but also you need to worry about the horizontal also. And to that extent, you need to see some of the buildings, um, houses, etc., if they're available. Those are all the important uh, you know, uh, features that will help you whether there is any horizontal shift between the two data sets. So ultimately, your product should be adjusted both horizontally as well as vertically. That's very critical. It's not only the vertical, but also the horizontal also has to be addressed. So I mean, you know, we go through the entire process. After you do the horizontal and vertical adjustment, again, you go through a sort of visual inspection that has to be done from north to south to make sure that you know, the entire process has gone well. 
So this is, uh, you'll be wondering what is this uh, slide, you know, this is a sort of wheel shape for the entire corridor of close to 700, um, <clears throat> 700 miles. Um, you know, after merging everything, all the four different data sets, this is what we have created, I think just to give you an impression. So this is a, a more closer look of the data set um, of the wheel shape created from the, from the merged LiDAR data. This is how we can create a product. And of course, just we overlaid some of the vectors just to make sure that you know everything lines up right. With that, uh, I believe I mean you know this is a classic example um, when there is a change on the ground. Suppose if you have a data set one taken in 2010, data set two taken in 2014, but in between these four years, a lot of changes have taken place on the ground. Then you will see when you take the cross section profile, you will see the difference between those two data sets. Just to show you an example when there is so many changes have taken place on the ground. <clears throat> so with that, uh, I go to the next topic, which is the brake lines. Again, uh, the brake lines are very critical to any LiDAR project. Um, apparently, just for your recollection, for those who, who were present last year, I made a similar type of paper specifically on the brake lines. So, you know, the, for a quick recap on brake lines, uh, you know, the brake lines are very critical for the simple reason it uh, it, it gives the, you know, it, we can represent the terrain in a better manner with the brake lines. So that's one of the reasons brake lines are needed for any LiDAR project. The brake lines can be a 2D brake line or a 3D brake line. And the brake lines can be for the hydro brake lines covering the lakes, ponds, and the streams. Or it can be their transportation features like roads, etc. And most important thing in the last line, um, the brake lines help in defining the contour behavior. So that's, that's why you connect the brake lines you know, on any LiDAR project. So there are different ways you can capture the brake lines. One is the photogrammetry. Everyone is aware of that. But nor normally when you have the LiDAR data, you will not have the, um, you will normally you may not collect the imagery, but there are cases where you will have the imagery also. The other way will be the radiogrammetry wherein you can collect the 3D brake lines from the LiDAR data. And the other one is the 2.5D, we call it, but effectively it is a 2D, uh, wherein you take the intensity data, capture the brake lines, and then drape it onto the surface, and that way you will get the Z value. So these are all the three different methods by which you can collect the brake lines. So when you are having multiple data sets, um, every vendor might have followed certain ways. You know, it can be a 3D brake lines, or it can be a 2D brake lines. So that's one of the reasons when you get a, a project of this nature, <clears throat> you, again, you review the metadata and uh, make the appropriate um, you know, judgment in terms of uh, using the brake lines. So the, what, what you do is you, know, you see whether the completeness of data set, that's very critical. And you know, whether it's the hydro brake lines or the transportation brake lines, what is that it is covered? Whether it's a 2D brake lines or 3D brake lines, and finally, <laughs> What is the, 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 the spatial reference, whether the datum, projection, everything are same. If they're not same, you have to bring them to a common projection and datum level. And uh, <clears throat> once you have all the brake lines, um, you need to do certain pre-processing before you jump onto the processing stage. Uh, these are all the very standard uh, GIS uh, thing, you know, there should not be no dangles, no undershoot, no overshoot, especially if you get uh, <clears throat> data from different uh, sources make sure that the data is as clean as possible. That's, that's, the, that's the, the, the purpose of uh, this exercise. And the, the next stage is, of course, you know, once you complete the, the brake lines, and uh, as well as the LiDAR data, then the, the next stage will be the, uh, the edge matching. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the project, what you have done is we have uh, two different type of users. Uh, one set of users are the pipeline engineers. Um, they wanted the product in AutoCAD format, uh, which means uh, primarily the deliverables are the surface as well as the two-foot contour. So that is what the, the product, one set, of, one set of users or the client, they wanted the data in that particular format. Then there is another set of users or the, or the clients, uh, they wanted the data to be in GIS format. So that means you, know, you have the same, the LiDAR points, which is the ground points, and you have got the brake lines. But we have to go through a workflow so that you can re create two different products. One is related in, to the, one is in given in AutoCAD surface as well as the two foot contours. The other one is of course uh, you know on the you know, in the ESRI platform. 
um, one of the thing, one of the things that is uh, the biggest challenge here is, especially in the case of AutoCAD, is in terms of creating the contours. You know, you need to have the, as I said, the contour should be a seamless product. And one of the major issues that we will be we are faced in, in 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 this type of project is edge matching. So you, you will be in a project of this nature, close to 10,000 tiles is what we have had. So think of um, 2,500 feet by 2,500 feet is what the tile size. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side imagery is uh, three tiles, uh, adjacent three tiles. The most critical thing is the contour should um, follow, in the sense there should not be any edge break, there should not be any break in terms of the, at the edges. So that means if you're having 10,000 uh, tiles, <clears throat> you can think of the volume of work involved in making sure that you are giving a seamless product. So this is a, this is another a major challenge uh, at the post-processing level, and uh, with, which, which we are able to solve by developing some in-house tools. And finally, we are able to deliver a product, uh, you know, which is uh, very seamless, uh, seamless in nature. So this, I believe. Um, the last two slides, yes, that's right. So, I'm open to any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, the overall data set, how many terabytes was that? That, that had been phenomenal. Uh, yeah, each data set was somewhere around uh, two to three terabytes, and uh, some another problem is that you have to create some intermediate file. So give or take, uh, we should have added 10 to 12 terabytes of data over a period of time. Yes, sir. So once you are cast, accept the task to patch together these LiDAR data from multiple sources, do you then take up responsibility for the accuracy of the final product? How do liability issues are handled? Okay. That's, that's a very relevant question, yeah. Uh, that's what I said. The very first thing we do is the metadata. And uh, in, in those data sets, which is already collected and processed and validated, as a rule of thumb, I think we should not touch the data because it has gone through a validation process and some amount of good number of checkpoints would have been collected and the data has met the accuracy. So as a rule of thumb, once a valid vertical accuracy is validated, those old data set, in my opinion, we should not touch the data. One thing is you need to make sure that the break lines are correct or something like that, but the ground points as given by the vendor or as validated by the agency, we should use it as it is. There is the new data, obviously, you will go through the same process and there will be some vertical accuracy requirements will be there. You have to meet that vertical accuracy requirement. So that's, that's how you can handle it. Otherwise, you start playing with the old data set, I don't think it's correct because once the data is validated, it's validated. I mean, you know, it has gone through a certification process, you should stop there. 